Welcome back, friends. It's me, Art Dallas, from Nimble Pros once again. And today I think we should look at a programming principle called parse don't validate. And I'm gonna show you what the problem is with just doing validation everywhere in your application. And then in the next video, we're gonna look at some patterns we can use to try and mitigate some of those issues. Now, a while ago, I did do another video on when to validate and when to throw exceptions, and this kind of builds on that. So if you wanna check that one out, you can. Uh, just look for that in the history or click the little link that should be there right now. And I also wanna give credit to Alexis King, who wrote this great blog post about this back in 2019 called parse don't validate and referring more so to functional programming and Haskell, but the general principles definitely apply regardless of your programming language. So, you know, this is all stuff that's good for you to understand as a .NET developer building things with ASP.NET Core or what, really whatever framework you're using. Now, before we get into this, I do wanna mention that I have recently published this course, Getting Started with ASP.NET Core on Dome Train. And if you use my name, Ardalis, uh, you'll get a 20% uh, discount on the course. So be sure to check that out and you can save 20%. All right, now let's get into the code. To demonstrate this, I took the really basic bare bones minimal API template that you get with .NET 9 now. And I just did a file new project with that and then created an example that kind of shows what happens if you have a more real world application that actually has uh, some services, maybe some entities, some kind of persistence, and you do validation at each step of the way. All right, so we have the standard weather forecast thing that comes with this template. You've probably seen it. And what I'm doing here is I'm taking in this request and we'll take a look at what that's what that has. It's just a uh, request that includes an integer for days. It has a little bit of stuff here to tell you that's required and it has to be at least one. And then a zip code, which I've added because you need to somehow to know where the weather is. And so with the zip code, I've got a real simple regex uh, and something that says the zip code has to be in, in a certain format. All right, so that's our request. And what we're gonna do is pass that in and we're gonna do uh, validation on that right here. And this is gonna use a validation context. It's gonna try and validate the object. And if it does not succeed, then we're gonna return a bad request. And we'll see that in action in just a moment. Now, if it does succeed, then we're gonna go into this try catch block. We're gonna call this service. that's gonna go and get the forecast. Right now in the original template that just happened right here inside of program.cs. Of course, that's not usually how you wanna write real world applications. So this is gonna split out that business logic into a separate class. Maybe it would even belong in a separate project, that's up to you. But now this weather service, which we'll jump into here, is gonna call get forecast. And of course, it also is taking in integer days and this string zip code, and it also then needs to validate those inputs. Now it's just returning a list of weather forecasts. So because we're not using something like our Dallas.result that makes it easy for you to return different types of non-happy path results, we're left with just the use of exceptions generally as a way to return things that aren't the expected result. And that's what we'll be doing here. So when we call validate inputs, it's gonna perform essentially validation uh, right here. But now if it's not valid, instead of just returning a validation, uh, error or, or message, we're gonna throw an argument exception. Uh, could be an argument out of range exception, whatever. So in here, we're gonna do one for days, we'll do one for zip code. And then I added another one here for just 9999 so that you can see, really five nines, so that you can see if uh, we hit this one as opposed to the one at the front. All right, then if we are successful, uh, we get past validate inputs. This is the same code that was originally inside of program.cs. It's gonna generate these forecasts. And then to simulate having some type of persistence, we're also gonna define an entity and have that entity need to store those same values. Now, we're not actually saving anything here because that's not important to this demo, but I do wanna just show you what that entity might look like because your entities typically need to have some kind of validation or, or protections against invalid data on them as well. And so in here, we've got the temperature and the zip code, and we're gonna do some checks. We're gonna use our Dallas guard clauses as a library to guard against things being out of range for the temperature in Celsius. Of course, it shouldn't be below negative 273, that's absolute zero. And probably on this planet, we don't wanna see temperatures over 200 degrees Celsius either. Uh, we're also gonna check the zip code and make sure it's not an invalid zip code. And so for that, we've got a custom guard clause that says guard against invalid zip code. Uh, and I'll show you that in a second. Now, of course, if you wanna update this entity, you're gonna have to do those same guards. So you're gonna have this duplicate code here, 
versus here, and again for the zip code there versus in the constructor. So some duplicate code, not real happy about that, but it is important to kind of make sure that you're not getting invalid data into your entity that's then gonna get persisted in your database. Now to make your own custom guard exception or extension method, uh, all you have to do is something like this, create a static ext extensions class, and then put in whatever your extension name should be. Have it come off of this.iGuard clause. That's what all the guard clauses in our Dallas.Guard clauses uses. And then you can create whatever logic you want in here to do whatever that work is. So let's see how this thing works. So we're gonna run it, and then we're gonna go to our HTTP file, and we're gonna run some requests to, to see how this thing goes. So we're gonna send this request with three days and a zip code of all fours, and we get a 200 okay, and you see we get back three results. Now, if we send back a day that's out of range, something like zero, we see we get a 400 bad request. If our zip code is not in the right format, but the day's back, we expect that we'll get a bad request here as well. Uh, if we make it so it, it is in the right format, but it's five nines, then we're gonna get a different error. This is coming back saying it can't be all nines. That's coming from the service where it's raising an exception. Uh, we could also write some test cases to show how we would see those exceptions coming from the entity as well. But the, the point is, that we're doing a lot of duplicate code to do all this validation. Now I made another quick example here that I'll show where you can also go and say, I wanna get a weather forecast for a given year, month, day. And in here, we're gonna pass those in, we're gonna validate them and return bad requests if they're not the right ones. Otherwise we'll say get forecast for date, pass in that year, month, day, uh, go to definition on that. You can see we're gonna duplicate that same validation pretty much here. Then we're gonna try and parse the date into a date only. And if we still can't make that work, we'll say that's an invalid date. Then we'll return this new weather forecast. All right, and so if we try that one out as well, you're gonna see that in here when we send a request for let's say uh, March 15th next year, that should be fine. But if we do it in the past, it doesn't like trying to give you a forecast for something that already happened. It doesn't like trying to give you a uh, month that's out of range or a day that's you know way out of range so we'll send that request like all that stuff works but then if you give it a day that's like the 29th of february 2026 let's say uh there, there isn't such a day so then we'll get this invalid date which is from that try catch in the service all right now hopefully if you've watched this far you're looking at this you're looking at this weather service and and these parameters that it's taking and you're saying, you know what, Steve, that's not how I would ever write this code. I would certainly just pass in a date time or, or a date only, right? There's no reason to pass around these primitive values here. Now, sure, maybe in program.cs, this route makes sense. But as soon as I got those primitive values for that in year, month, and day, I would certainly put those into a better type that already knows that it's got certain boundaries and, and can't be created in an out of range manner. Right, and so if I were to move this work from in here that says, hey, try and make a date only out of this, if I were to just take that and put it in program.cs, you know, right here on this very first line, right, then guess what? I wouldn't have to do any of these other checks. And that is completely correct, right? That's what parse means, right? When we say this, you know, date only here that I'm gonna take, I'm parsing year, month, and day into a type that has more information. Right. When I don't do that, when I don't parse into something that has more information and I just pass the primitives along, that history, that knowledge is lost. So right here, I'm inside my web API endpoint. I have run three checks to tell me that the year, month, and day have certain conditions, right? So I know on this line that those conditions are true. But when I go into this get forecast for date, I'm not passing in any context, any metadata, anything that says that knowledge that I now have, right? So it's all lost. And as soon as we go in here uh, and we, we go to this one's definition, right? We have to do those checks again because we have no idea what happened before this. Nothing is telling us that someone already checked these things and, and we've lost that information, right? Now, the way that you pass that information into deeper parts of your application is through the type system. And by taking these primitives and instead of having primitive obsession and passing primitives all the way down, pass actual types that encapsulate the information that you've gained, that you know that they are valid, that you know that they're in a certain range. And by doing that, you will make it so that you don't need to do these checks down here because you will already know that it is a valid type 
of, of that custom type that you've made, not a primitive. All right, so like I said, in the next video, we're gonna show some patterns that you can apply that'll make it much easier for you to do this throughout your application. But I hope if you weren't familiar with the phrase parse don't validate, that this has introduced you to that. And again, I wanna point you at this great blog post here uh, by Alexis King, where you can read more about that. Uh, the general idea is that instead of losing that information when you validate, you want to take that information forward by parsing into a more constricted type that can't be representing data in an invalid format. That's the key. All right, so until next time, keep improving.